So today I wanted to talk to you guys about a pretty cool encounter that came up in the campaign that I've been running. So one of the things that I've been wanting to do with this Dawnwing campaign that I was talking about last time was I want to have it be a very urban adventure with a lot of, um, you know, really like city type of encounters, close quarters, uh, battles where you're surrounded, you know, by buildings rather than in the wilderness. And it's kind of a, it's a cool thing because you know, we always want to try to put adventures in cities, but sometimes it can be kind of challenging to think of, all right, you've got a billion NPCs, you've got a billion buildings and structures. It's not just like there's a forest and there's a bunch of trees and like, don't worry about it. So um, I just want to kind of give you guys some tips if you're working on, you know, uh, b building big city adventures. It's not really as scary as it, it might seem uh, off the bat. Uh, you can kind of build your adventures like dungeons. You can build the map kind of dungeon-y, but it's alleyways and streets and things. And um, it's not quite so bad when you're when you're to manage once you kind of get into it. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you about a really cool adventure, a really cool encounter that, uh, that came up um, on our first day. So the way I started the Dawnwing adventure was I just said, um, here's the background of the area. You guys are all mercenaries. You all work for a company called the Iron Assembly, and you've been assigned to basically be bodyguards to this very wealthy um, uh, guy who is, he's a transmutation wizard. So he's kind of a, a very fancy jeweler, right? He makes all these fancy like pieces of jewelry, fancy like clothes clothing and things that change color with the seasons depending on your you know what what you need it to be so a uh, very you know fancy magic item thing but not a type of magic item that the characters are going to care about that much not weapons or armor or anything like that uh, mostly jewelry mostly very high-end jewelry uh, anyway so they they work for the iron assembly and the iron assembly is kind of um, they're more like rent -a cops than they are uh, like a mercenary company in the sense of like Dungeons and Dragons where you have like an army that's doing all these fighting and fighting monsters and battles and everything. Um, I started the characters at level one because I do love level one adventures because I love that like, you know, a house cat could bite you wrong and kill you, right? I like the party starting off afraid. Uh, of silly things and growing into being super, super powerful. It also helps the party composition because they all start to kind of grow together, right? If you all start at level one and you realize at level one that nobody's picked a guy who can talk to, to strangers, then that's a lot better than everybody just rolls up fifth level characters and you realize you don't have a, you don't have a, a, a face, you don't have a charisma guy. So it kind of allows people to kind of fill in the cracks and fill in the, the party composition. And it makes for some really cool character building, um, you know, once when these characters are level eight or ten or something and they're fighting, you know, smaller dragons and stuff, they can go back and remember the time that they had to fight wolves with a stick kind of thing. Anyway, the first, the way that I started this uh, encounter out was, these guys are bodyguards. They work for the, the this lord. I called him uh, Lord Amberwood. Uh, he's this very rich elf guy, and they have to um, to work for him. And one of the things with this guy is he's kind of like a Wolf of Wall Street kind of guy, right? He's got a lot of shady stuff going on. He's got a you know a bunch of fancy people that he works with, but he also has some pretty shady guys that come by the uh, come by the manor, right? And so these guys run security on the manor, but what ends up happening is uh, he's got to go make a deal in one of the the more like shadier parts of town. He has to go to the town bazaar, and he has to make a deal with some pretty gnarly guys down there. So you, your party is assigned to bodyguard him. Um, you're carrying a large crate. You don't know what's in it. You know it's heavy. It's a big box that has a, a, you know, one person in the front and one person in the back to carry it. It is heavy enough that, I mean, it's not too heavy that like one person could lift it and move it and walk with it at half speed. But, you know, this is kind of, you're going to be moving through the city. So it's going to be a couple hour journey each direction. I made the city huge. Uh, but so you can't like, one person's not going to want to carry it the whole time, but in a pinch, in an encounter, you could, uh, you could pick it up and carry it and stuff. And so you had to have two guys carrying it. And then I had uh, the rest of the crew, there was three other guys, and then they kind of fanned out around, uh, around the area. And then I had one person from the Iron Assembly who was kind of their commanding officer. And she was a third level ranger. And um, 
uh, they kind of had to take orders from her. And so she walked next to the Lord and then they kind of were responsible for filling out the rest of the security detail. And, uh, you know, they move through the city and it's going fine. And then when we get to the bazaar, I draw it out on the map. And one thing I like doing in Dungeons and Dragons is making party, making the party roll unnecessary perception checks, right? So when they get to the edge of this bazaar, I draw out the map and it's, you know, it's basically the main street with a bunch of side alleys coming out of it and then market stalls down it. And then I just basically took every mini that I owned and just spread them out all like just made the street look as crowded and insane as possible. The different alleys, it was just a nightmare, security nightmare, trying to bodyguard this one dude through this crazy street that was just uh, just absolutely bonkers. And I started making them roll perception checks. You know, I was I was letting them do perception checks to kind of see, you know, this guy doesn't, you know, this is this guy's. Maybe you can spot a weapon. Maybe you can spot, uh, you know, something, something that like looks out of place. And I was allowing them also to roll sense motive checks to kind of see if they could find a guy that was looking a little shifty. Maybe he had like some kind of bad, bad intentions. Um, and. And there's nothing, right? There's no, there's no attack on him at this part of the bazaar. But I've drawn it on the map, and I'm making the party roll perception checks, and the party is scared because they're level one. They're they're not sure what that they can handle any kind of serious combat encounter anyway. Uh, but I like making them scared, and I like making them roll some checks that they don't have to roll. So then they get to the warehouse where they're going to make this drop. They go down, and they cut into one of these alleyways, and then they go into this warehouse. And our map's big enough that I could just draw it straight on there. Uh, and in the warehouse, they, they go down to the warehouse, and there's two like guys outside with their hoods up. Uh, but you can see the snouts, and they're rat folk. And they're kind of, one's bigger and one's smaller, and they're standing outside. And the guard, that uh, the, their sergeant who came with them, when they get to the door, she kind of is like two out here with these guys. And then she goes in. So I split the party. I've got two guys out front with the two rat guys, and they're, you know, the rat guys aren't talkative, but they're not aggressive. And then when you go in, there's a drop that you have to make. So you have to bring, come in, you have to drop off the box that you brought with you. There's the bad guy, you know, who's very similarly dressed, right? And these guys are very rich, very wealthy people. They're dressed in a cloak with a hood up, but the cloak is like gold lined. So they stick out like a sore throat, especially in like a, in a bazaar kind of setting. And, um, and then he's got a security detail with him. And I try to make it very tense, right? Uh, oh, you have the thing, you know, try to like make people roll some perceptions and stuff. And the guys that he's with are pretty well armed. And I try to kind of make it a little bit more tension, right? Oh, well, you know, this guy says that maybe he, he, this wasn't quite the deal. Like you're missing one piece and then they negotiate and I make the party in between, you know, in between I kind of, all right, what do you guys want to do anything? Okay, you don't want to do anything? You're going to keep waiting? Okay. And so you continue on with the scene where these two guys are kind of arguing and negotiating and nothing happens again. And so then the party's kind of like, kind of on edge because they're feeling like something's going to happen, but it wasn't in the, wasn't in the street and it wasn't these, these criminal dudes that were at the, at the drop. And so they drop off the box that, um, that they had brought with them. And it's this very fancy uh, golden idol kind of deal. And they pick up uh, three paintings that are in like a, uh, wrapped in paper, right? Uh, that like packing paper kind of stuff. But they're three paintings that are just super, super valuable. And so this is the trade that they're making. And then the party has to carry the same deal. You, need, you want, you don't, you can lift these paintings with one guy, but you want to, because these paintings are very valuable and they're very fragile. Okay, bad guys leave through a back door. You guys leave the way you came. You go back up, and when you get to the back, when you get back to the main street, roll perceptions again. This time, there's dudes in the crowd that are coming to kill Lord Emberwood, and um, we were lucky enough to have the party that was in my encounter was lucky enough to have somebody spot him. Somebody rolled a natural twenty, which is basically what you need to get these guys. Um, it's three assassins in the uh, four assassins in the in the crowd and they're you know level two rogues or ones of level two wizard but they've got disguised person on their face uh so what he saw was when he looked over he saw a dude who kind of like changed his face like that with a disguised person spell and um he goes up and basically uh the main guy was a um i think he was a magus because he did a, a um a sneak attack with a shocking grass charge into it but 
the way that I played this so that it didn't just immediately kill a party member was that I had that sergeant. She had a one of those feats that allows you to kind of take a hit for somebody that's in an adjacent square. So she got nailed for like a 35 point shocking grass sneak attack. Uh, but she's yelling like knife and then gets in front of it, takes the hit, goes down, roll initiative. You know that this guy's one of them. But like I said, I've got every mini I own is out on this map. And uh, and now the party's in trouble because they don't know who's a good guy, who's a bad guy. And the way I marked her was I just put like a dice next to her. And I was like, all right, she's a bad guy. Everybody else, it's too early to, to tell what's going on. Uh, you know, let's let, let go. So uh, the way I did, I ran it was uh, the guy that beat the perception check to spot the assassin they got to go in the order of their initiative during the surprise round nobody else got to go then we started at the top and we went down and when it was people's turns they had to kind of figure out what they were going to do and i had an archer on one of the roofs uh who um would come came up and take a sh took a shot and i had a wizard in one of the market stalls as one of the people that were working there and he had a uh, uh he would magic he magic missiled out of there um and then there was a third guy that was in the crowd somewhere. He was going to come in after, like, he was going to kind of wait for them to kind of be pushing through, and then he was going to come around and, and try to shank uh, Emberwood with a sneak attack. Uh, you know, the party, every round at the top of the round, I had I let everybody roll a, uh, a perception check or a sense motive check. And the DC I gave for it was just a straight 25. Uh, I think the way you're supposed to do that is to kind of have it roll against their... Uh, disguise or their um, their stealth, but I didn't really want to roll a million dice, so I just had them roll. If they could beat a 25, which is a really hard roll to beat on a level 1 character, um, then I would give them uh, an ID on one of the guys. Uh, but that didn't really happen, so they were kind of, these assassins were getting picked up as they would attack, and they were all attacking Lord Emberwood. They don't care about the bodyguards. They just want to kill this guy and get out of there. Um, but one of the cool disguised person things they did was if they knocked one of these guys out or took them down, when they went down, their face changed back to their regular face because the spell wore off. So that was kind of a fun visual. And the party got pretty... I mean, this wasn't a super intense encounter, right? They were not outnumbered. There was less of the bad guys, but they were better quality. They were a level up. Uh, and... Um, but it was kind of an interesting encounter because you have every mini on the map. And then on my turn, like I had a roll for the crowd and I would just move the crowd. Like some people would just freeze and be like panicked and some people would run and you had this like log jam of like claustrophobia. The party ended up like going up into a side alley and digging in that way. And basically what the party ended up doing was just creating as much havoc as possible, flipping things over and screaming and yelling and like firing crossbows in the air to try to scare the crowd because they were like, okay, we'll scare the crowd and then anybody who doesn't run is in on it and they did a good job they ended up uh they used a fear spell to scare off the archer on the roof uh they ended up taking down the the magus with who had the sneak attack and uh they got the wizard in the crowd the other dude in the crowd the rogue he escaped um and another cool thing you can do about an urban adventure is after all these guys are down um they, they were like all right well cool we'll, we'll search the bodies and it's like all right well the Cops are coming, right? The sound guard's coming, and they're kind of in in range of the of of the battle now, right? They're showing up, and you know they're there to kind of stop the thing. And uh, I guess the model I used for this was that scene in Clear and Present Danger, where they they try to take out the convoy in the alleyway, right? So you've got the bad guys on the roofs, you got the bad guys on the ground, uh, and but then when the cops show up. The guy's like, all right, we search the bodies. I was like, okay, we well, find this pin. I wanted them to find this pin because it identifies the organization of the bad guys. It's a little pin in the shape of a chimera, and it's on the inside of one of the cloaks so that you could flash it to somebody, but it's not identifiable from the outside. So they found this chimera pin, and um, but these, some of these, these guys had, like, pretty good weapons, right? They had, like, you know, uh, like the Assassin's Creed, like, wrist wrist thing, and they had, like, then that was masterwork, and they had some, you know, masterwork bow and stuff. But, uh, but you can't loot these guys because you're in a city, right? You, if, you just, if you murder a person in the street, you don't get their stuff. That's not the way the world works. So the guards are like, that's evidence. Like, you, you that's staying. We, I allowed him to, like, kind of pocket the, kind of pocket the pin because I wanted him to have that, and it's an easy enough thing that you could steal. But... Um, you don't get to take his sword because you killed him in the middle of the street in a, in a battle, right? And um, uh, Lord Emberwood kind of 
plays with the do you know who I am kind of card and is able to get a uh, get the guys um, and because they're mercenaries in the city they kind of have a permit you know there's a kind of an understanding that they're allowed to draw weapons to defend the person that they have a contract to defend so you know it takes an hour for them to kind of talk through this stuff but uh, eventually they get they get away and they go back to the manor and Lord Emberwood's telling about his bravery because he took an arrow at some point but then they fought off all of the assassins together and um, kind of takes credit for a lot of the a lot of the assassins or a lot of the uh, bodyguards and what they did um, but he does give them a spot bonus of a month's salary, which is 10 gold each. So, <laughs> Anyway, I thought that was a cool encounter. It was a fun way to start. There's a lot of interesting things you can do with a huge map. A uh, tiny map, every mini you own, and you don't know who's the good guys and who's the bad guys. Could be pretty fun. Maybe something you could try out in your adventures. Uh, I don't know. I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week with uh, another painting.